we'll kick off now with the fourth press conference. This one is titled From Avalanches to Aviation, the Sahara's Global Impacts. Uh, so good afternoon and welcome to VEGU 21. Uh, this year's virtual annual meeting of the European Geosciences Union. This year we've got more than 14,000 abstracts and 16,000 people from across the globe participating in this meeting. I'm Erin Martin-Jones, this year's EGU press conference assistant, and I'll be hosting today's session, which will include a question and answer period following presentations by all three speakers. So to allow members of the media to ask your own questions, we're conducting this as a Zoom meeting. So once the last of our three speakers has finished, please either drop your question into the chat box or the letter Q, and I'll come to you to ask your question, or equally I can read out your question if you'd rather. So hopefully this doesn't happen, but if for some reason Zoom suddenly quits, we will restart the conference, give you a few minutes to rejoin. And likewise, if you have problems at home with your internet and you have to rejoin the session, that's absolutely fine. There'll be someone to let you back in. There's a lot of really useful information on the press, the online press center for EGU. So that's media.edu.eu. And you'll find all the abstracts and other documents relating to these press conferences up there. So please have a look there. And so I'll introduce our three panelists panelists for this session now to make for faster transitions in between times. So for this Sahara themed press conference, first up, we have Dr. Marie Dumont, who is director of the Snow Research Center at Meteo France in France. Secondly, we have Dr. Athanios, Athanios Votis, Votsis, sorry, who is senior researcher at the Finnish Meteorological Institute in Finland. And last but not least, we have Dr. Sara Beisart, who is postdoctoral researcher at the Barcelona Computing Center in Spain. So I'll now hand over to each of our speakers coming to you in that order to unmute yourselves and give a short presentation. And then after that, we will go to questions. So Marie, would you like to come forward first? Yes, thank, thank you. <clears throat> so I'll start sharing the screen and I hope it works and you hear me. All yeah, good? we've got you in, in the slides as well, that's fine. Okay, great. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm happy to, to be here. So I'm Marie Dumont. And uh, on behalf of uh, my colleagues and co author um, today I'm presenting some new results uh, that uh, we have shown at EGU on the impact of saran dust uh, on snow. So uh, here in the background, you have a peak who was take, which was taken in, the, in February two, um, this year after a huge uh, thyroid dust event of early February. And it's showing a uh, really orange surface, which in fact is snow. So that's typically the type of event we are looking for and also the impact of that type of event. event. And on the right here, uh, the peak is showing a slab avalanche. And I don't know if it's really visible on, on, on the screen, but this slab avalanche was triggered in February uh, 2014. And you see the dust layer, uh, which is just uh, below the avalanche. And this triggers several questions. So what are the impacts of the saran dust event on, dust, on snow evolution? And can such events impact the snow stability and the risk of avalanche hazards? So I can change the slide. <laughs> ah, great. Uh, so uh, the first thing we were looking at is the impact on the on the snow evolution and on the snow melt and duration. So the primary impact of such deposition of saran dust on the snow, it's visible on this picture here. It's a really a change of color. So this was taken in April this year. Um, close to, to my lab. And here the orange snow is here. It's not contaminated by, by the soil. It's directly contaminated by saran dust. So it's really orange compared to the white snow here. And the main difference between the two is that the white snow is reflecting most of the solar radiation. So just incoming from the sun, while the other 
the, the orange snow is reflecting half of the solar radiation, which means that due to the dust, there is much more energy which is coming in in the snowpack and which will lead to an increase in temperature of the snowpack and then accelerate and melt. So in one of our study, we, will, uh, we were looking over the past 40 years of the impact of such events combined with the other uh, colored particles such as black carbon and the impact of these particles on snow cover durations. And we were showing that over the last 40 years in the French Alps and the French Pyrenees, the deposition of dust combined with uh, black carbon is responsible for shortening of the snow cover of on average uh, 17 days. So that's quite huge in terms of hydrological impact, for example. And for the event of this year, so of early February, we are now estimating that the impact at some place in the French Alps and Pyrenees is more than one month of, uh, of, of, of shortening of the, of the snow duration. So as I just uh, said before, uh, dust, uh, the, 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 the shortening of the snow season is not the only impact of the sarin dust deposition on the snowpack. So once this dust layer is deposited on the snowpack, so it changes the color, it changes the absorption of energy, and it's also changing the internal temperature profile into the snowpack. And this is really important because it's controlling the way the structure of the snowpack is evolving. So we ask ourselves a question, which is often asked by mountain practitioner and also avalanche forecaster, which is, is there a relationship between the dust, sarin dust events and uh, an increase uh, uh, destabilization of the snowpack. So for this, we conducted several ensemble uh, snowpack simulation with dust event and without dust event, and we were able to show that under certain meteorological conditions, the dust layer may favor, uh, uh, is promoting the formation of a weak layer and then a higher uh, slab avalanche. But this is not systematic. This is really uh, highly dependent on meteorological condition, and on other situation, it can also lead to to more stable snowpack. The other effect of the dust deposition is that due to the uh, decrease in albedo, it's an increase in absorbed energy, there will be earlier in the season more liquid water content in the snowpack. And this will lead to higher risk of wet snow avalanches problem as seen on the, on the right part of this slide here. So that's about it. And I um, can try to answer any question after the two next talk. Thank you, Marie, for that introduction. So next up, we have a video to show you from uh, Athion, Athion, Athanasios, excuse me. Um, I don't know, I notice that you are here in the audience. I don't know if you want to say anything in addition to showing the video. Uh, not really, it is nice to stick to the plan, but very nice to see you all here and uh, very nice to see this exciting session. It's Sahara and something about this imagery is always interesting and important and exciting. So we can, we can just go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so Fabio, if you want to show the video. Nasios Votsis, and I will give you a briefing Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Athanasios Votsis and I will give you a briefing on how the Dust Clean project helps the solar energy sector to cope with sand and dust storms and the associated risks and impacts. I represent a consortium funded by the European Commission's Era for Climate Services initiative, which consists of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, the Spanish and Finnish Met Services, France's CNRS and Italy's CNR. I myself am an assistant professor at the Department of Governance and Technology for Sustainability at the University of Twente in the Netherlands, and I am as well a senior researcher at the Climate Change and Society Group at the Finnish Meteorological Institute. As you can see in the picture, Sand and dust storms can involve the transport and deposition of tremendous amounts of mineral matter over large distances and geographical expanses with significant disruptions to society and the economy. Yet, they are also part, an essential part, I would say, of the Earth's natural processes with their own geographical and seasonal patterns 
that relate in quite concrete ways and aspects to the industry. In Dust Clean, we have focused on aviation, which is presented in another talk by my colleague Sarah Bassert, and on solar energy. I will take you through in this talk our main climate products for solar photovoltaic panels. Our first product is the so-called transmissivity reduction or soiling index. It describes how much the energy output of a solar PV panel in percentage terms is dropping as sand and dust accumulates on its surface. We are providing maps and the necessary background numerical data that describe the annual and seasonal characteristics of this indicator. For the time frame between 2007 and 2016, at a 10 by 10 kilometers geographical resolution and based on a three hourly time interval over that larger period, which is an unprecedented um, level of geographical and temporal detail in this particular aspect. As you can see, we are providing maps that cover the multi-year annual climatological, so to speak, behavior of the soiling index over different areas of the NAME region, meaning North Africa, the Middle East and Europe. And we are breaking that down also seasonally, meaning we are providing the same behavior uh, of um, the soiling index in winter, in spring, in summer and in autumn. In addition, we are breaking down this information even further and we can provide more particular time series at more, uh, let's say, detailed time intervals, not so aggregated, uh, for every particular location that you can see in these maps. Next, we provide the same kind of geographical and seasonal information for sunshine duration, which is an essential part of productivity of solar PV panels, which is also corrected for the presence of dust which is not usually taken into account in other sunshine duration products. We combine this with the previously mentioned soiling index and also with other technical and economic performance information such as electricity prices and cleaning costs. And with this information in hand and this approach, we provide a further product called optimal cleaning frequency which describes how often in days a solar PV panel must be cleaned in order to produce electricity above cleaning costs. Currently, we give this information for commercial and for domestic sizes of panels. And as you can see, we provide the same level of geographical and seasonal or temporal information as with the previously described soiling index product. Finally, we provide information about investment and operational risk. On the far left and far right of the slide, you can see examples of how volatile the soiling index and sunshine duration, respectively, are in different regions. In the middle, you can see more details about the volatility of the optimal cleaning frequency if you zoom in into the particular time series in two uh, exemplary uh, locations near Barcelona and near Berlin. Thanks very much for your attention. We do invite colleagues from the industry to help us and partner up with us to develop version 2 of these products as we believe that they will add information that was not previously available to the industry and also hold a high potential for innovation, both technological but also broader societal one. For more information, don't hesitate to contact me at the University of Twente email address shown here, but also refer to a recent freely available publication for an overview of the operational risks of sand and dust storms in aviation and solar energy 
and what sort of approach and wider mentality we take in developing climate services and products to help in this respect. Thanks very much on behalf of the whole DASCLIM team. Excellent. So, as I said before, if you've got questions for our speakers, um, we'll save them up until the end. Um, and so if we head next to Dr. Sarah, uh, Sarah Bezart, Sarah is about. Yeah, I'm here. Can you okay. hear me? Yeah, I, can I hope you can see my screen. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation and thanks a lot for visiting us in this uh, uh, different session, let's say, than the typical EGU sessions. As Athanasia said, uh, we are involved in one project that is basically trying to assess some services related to the presence of sun and dust storms and the risk that the sun and dust storms represent for some sectors. As Athanasius mentioned, the project is, uh, is focusing in selected sectors, and one of them is aviation. As you can see in this, in this image, there are many of, of different impacts that we can identify in different countries, but also in different sectors of the society, not just uh, related to health, but also some socioeconomic sectors as the solar energy, uh, transportation, and uh, the focus today is the aviation. But also there are other impacts, as Marie has shown, related with weather, climate, or atmospheric chemistry. Then focusing in the part of the users, one of the fundamental things that you have to be in mind is that this, how is distributed the dust sources at global scale. Thanks to models and also satellites, we can identify the most prone dust areas that are in North Africa, Middle East, and also in Asia. Then if you take a close look to the image, you will see also that uh, some other sources in the South Hemisphere, in Australia, in South America, and also in the state, in the um, western part of the state, in the Colorado region. Then it's something that is not just Sahara as a source of dust, it's a global phenomenon. And we are uh, having this extra information coming from satellites and reanalysis, as I said. And this reanalysis is a fundamental tool for us for developing some services in sources because the lack of observations inside the deserts uh, is a problem that we can overcome with these modeling products. For dust clean, that is the project that Athanasius uh, pre-introduced before, we run a very exceptional reanalysis at very high resolution in the area of North Africa, Middle East and Europe, where you can find the most important areas of dust emission. And what we did with this uh, set, uh, with this initial information is to understand the problems related with the aviation. As you can see here, we are described a little bit the impacts on aviation, and it's basically related with the high concentrations at surface level that you can find. And this causes the reduction of the visibility, and this reduction of visibility is related with the closing of airports. This means reroutings and cancellation of flights. Also, there are some disturbances in the airport operations. This means that uh, the safety of the outside workers are in risk, but also we have to clean up more frequently the runways where the planes are using for the operations. In the image, you can see uh, a one event that was last year in Canary Islands, in Tenerife, and you can see how the visibility is reduced a few meters in very exceptional events as the one that I, it is in this picture. The, the airport was closed during three, one day, and more than 700 uh, flights were, were cancelled because this single event. But also there are other impacts related with the mechanical of the aircraft, and they are related with uh, ice crystals that can collapse the sensors around the air, aircraft, but also you can find other problems like the dust melting in the turbines or the turbine abrasion. As you can see here in this example, the famous Air France uh, accident that was cross, uh, it was covering the route of Paris to Rio de Janeiro was having the uh, accident in the middle of the Atlantic. And some reports and some studies point that these ice crystal formations surrounding the sensors around the aircraft can be one of the reasons of the accident, not the only one, but one of the sources of the first uh, 
initial impact of this accident. If we are thinking in long-term management planning, uh, climatological runs are fundamental because it's giving us this behavior of the dust over sources, uh, over sources and also uh, regions around the desert. And this is an example for aviation. We are taking a look about how many times per day during a, a time series of 10 years, uh, we were overpassing the threshold of visibility that the airports considered for safety. As you can see here, as we, we were expecting, the highest number of days is, is in the deserts, but also surrounding the, uh, the areas of dust emission, you can find days where this safety threshold is overpassed. If we move now to some more mechanical issues, as you can see in the image, the turbine exposed to dust can be very damaged if the, this dust is accumulated for longer periods of, of, of uh, of routes of traveling. And one of the things that we did uh, inside DASCLIM is to establish the dust exposure, uh, the aircraft dust exposure index that basically is showing you how much dust is accumulated for a specific route. As you can see here, reddish colors is indicating the maximum level of exposure and is in the sources in deserts, but also there are some European uh, airports where this exposure of dust is affected, the ones that are connecting Europe with Africa and the Middle East. I want to raise the question that there are a couple of airlines that are having their headquarters in the Middle East. Then the volume of these uh, new airlines is growing and growing in the last years. And we will expect that in the next years, their, their business will grow exponentially also. Then this kind of information is very useful for them. But also, if we move for a more short-term operations, uh, there is the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization Regional Center for Northern Africa, Middle East, and Europe, that is providing daily dust products. And these daily dust products include three days forecast of dust predictions. Then uh, the, the, stakeholder, the stakeholders uh, related with the operation, uh, with uh, aviation and people that is working in the airports, can get this information and try to mitigate the impacts of a potential extreme event related with dust, for example. And this is one of the examples. Again, the February 2020 event was well predicted by the models. And this information at the moment is not really used for the airport operations because they are not aware about this kind of information. And this is one of the things that we are trying to push also inside this dust clean project, but also in this WMO framework. And with this also, this is another big example that was this last year also, the famous Godzilla. It was a very exceptional event that was crossing the Atlantic from Africa to the Barbados, to the Caribbean. And uh, the models were, were able to predict this kind of events then uh, here I want to raise the, 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 the point that the information is there and we are getting access to the users that are interested in this kind of information. Then if you have interest, just send me an email and I will point you where you can get all this data. Thanks a lot. And this is all. Thank you and thank you to all of our three speakers for, for their fantastic talks. Um, I'd like to open up the floor now for questions uh, and if you'd either like to drop uh, the letter Q in the chat box and we'll come to you um, and you can unmute yourself or you can uh, ask the question in full in the chat and I can read it out. So um, please ask any questions. Okay, one in from Sarah Derwin, who says, uh, for, this is for Dr. Dumont, what does, this, what does this Sahara dust mean for water supplies from mountain systems? For example, does an earlier melt mean more water escapes the system? Uh, she says she lives in the US and much of the water in the Western US comes from winter snowpack. Uh, so thanks for the question. Uh, so when the snow is melting earlier, it's melt, it's, it means that uh, in uh, mountain regions, the water availability uh, peak is earlier also uh, in the season. So it means that the water is available 
earlier uh, in the season and not necessarily at the right moment for, ag um, for uh, crop uh, agriculture or any other usage. As for um, is the US and the Western US, I think there is an excellent paper uh, from Tom Pager um, about that, uh, which is called, uh, I think, the Rising Lime of Colorado. I can give you the reference if you need. Thank you. Any more questions? Any more questions? I think there's one that's come in, but it might be from someone who's anonymous. So maybe you could just un unmute yourself. I can't see who it's come in from actually. Was that Sarah again? Actually, it's me again. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. And I, sorry, I'm, I can probably speak faster than I can type. So um, uh, this is a, a question for Dr. Vostis um, about solar panels. I was just wondering if there are mechanical, specific mechanical risks to solar panels from dust and sand that you could talk about a little bit. I, I understand the dust can cover the solar panels, but I'm wondering about the mechanics of, of solar panels. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Sarah. So yes, uh, definitely. Uh, the same way that um, uh, Sarah, my colleague Sarah Bassard showed uh, those magnific magnificent effects of uh, dust uh, on, on the turbine surfaces, uh, the more complicated the solar panel mechanisms become in those dusty uh, regions, the more of those mechanical effects you will see. So uh, being very plain, uh, simply breaking down the mechanisms that make the solar panels move and follow, um, uh, and follow the optimum, optimum sun angle. But uh, even more, if you kind of try to relax a little bit uh, the definition of mechanical and bring a bit of chemistry inside, it's not just the dust particles that uh, drop on the solar panel and, well, block the sun from uh, doing its job with the panel, but also uh, they can mix with uh, some chemical reactions and start uh, corroding or eroding or uh, um, well, um, disrupting uh, the, the, the surface of, of the panel. So you have so many multiple um, channels, uh, purely mechanical, chemical, um, uh, and so many other combinations of them that uh, yes, it can become, can become rather complicated. I hope that answers the question. It did, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have another one in, this is from uh, Nicholas, who says, uh, and it's for Dr. Dumont and possibly others, uh, do you see an increase in Sahara dust reaching Europe and the Alps in recent years? I so maybe Sarah can also answer that uh, more uh, exhaustively than uh, more largely than me, uh, but on, um, uh, from my, on my knowledge, um, so, it's been proven that over uh, Central Europe and Caucasus, there has been a recent increase uh, in the frequency of uh, saran dust even there. As for the French apps in the reanalysis we are using, so Aladdin reanalysis, there is um, no trends uh, in the position over, over the Alps and the Pyrenees. So it's it's neither negative nor positive, it's just not, not significant. And we're su suspecting that it's uh, there is nothing because the but the interannual variability of the deposition is so high that 40 years might not be sufficient to get a robust strength. Um, maybe, Sarah, you have more information. As you said, there is no clear trend at the moment related with the intensity and transport to Europe. But it's true that this year and the past year was having a very exceptional event. And the one in February 2021 that you showed that was arriving to the Alps was quite exceptional and very social because all the people was looking at the snow and take this reddish color, then it was super popular. But also last year in 2020, there were these two exceptional events that was affecting Canary Islands and, and Atlantic. And we will see in the next years, but uh, it is not clear trend, let's say. It's not, it's not really something that we can ensure 
if there is more dust in the or more more number of events. This is something ongoing research, and maybe in next years we will see. Thank you both. And there's actually a question that's come in that's that's related to that that you might want to pick up on a bit more or perhaps not um, and it says according to our observations the intensity and frequency of wintertime Saharan dust events in central Europe is increasing is is it also true for French Alpine regions? So I think we we already answered that question but I agree with the fact that yeah. uh, there are proof of the increase in central Europe but not over the Alps and the Pyrenees so far but it's okay. ongoing as Sarah said Perhaps, perhaps I can chip in a little bit um, sure. uh, on this last question because it raises a, a rather important and not so frequently highlighted um, aspect because it's not just the intensity that's important for the way society copes with or is affected or is prepared, but it's also exactly the frequency. So it's the temporal patterns that you are used to um, concerning a certain phenomenon so sometimes uh, this becomes a little bit or even more as important as the intensity because it has to do with the way a particular sector or human activity is prepared. Uh, and, and that has to do a lot also with the temporal patterns, not just the amount that is coming. So that was a really nice question here. And it's important for uh, adaptation to those changes that might be coming. Thank you for picking that up as well. So any more questions for our team? Okay, so one from Sarah to everyone. Uh, what are some of these adaptations? Uh, if you know the problem and you understand the reasons, uh, it's possible to do some mitigation strategies. This is clear for desertification in some areas of, of Middle East or, or the agricultural part of the Sahel. If you see that the intensive act agriculture activities is drying the, the soil, this is risky because this means that the extension of the deserts can be higher. Then to understand where are the sources and what are the, the, the associated uh, reasons of this of these sources is important and related with the fact of the frequency that uh, Athanasius pointed some of the issues that we are raising now when we are discussing about the the intensity and the frequency is the new sources that the climate change can can have associated and this is really challenging because we are not really sure about the the extension of the desertification problem and when you are asking us how will be the future, we have to put it on the on the playground. Also, the anthropogenic contribution or contribution to the extension of the desert, for example. Then this is ongoing research, and there is a lot of discussions and scientific uh, assessments. And um, if you have the information in advance, always is is possible to to be adapted. And when you have information that is giving you a, a, an idea about how it's going in each part of the domain. This is also very useful for everyone. Depending on the sector, you have to adapt the information. Like aviation, we are using specific variables for uh, tourism, as Marie point, uh, the melting of dust, uh, uh, the melting of the snow due to the presence of dust can accelerate the the melt of the snow cover this is really bad for the ski uh, tourism for example then this is something that now starts to be very like on the frame frame front of the discussions how we can use all the information that we are producing in the research community for more user-oriented uh, activities and the adaptation is part of these discussions but yeah clearly yeah and, and perhaps to pick it up from Sarah, for example, for solar energy, uh, because it is so frequency dependent, uh, the amount of electricity you can produce or you should produce, and the prices change. So uh, knowing this uh, frequency information can also perhaps lead you to adaptation or adaptive responses about how often you should clean 
um, your solar panels because the cleaning has its own cost and you should sort of like optimize that cleaning and the way you clean, what method uh, you use according to uh, the way um, the dust cycle affects together with other variables, the way solar panels produce hour to hour or day to day uh, electricity and the price. So these are this can become very technical, sort of speak management <laughs> adaptations. And for airlines like Sarah was showing, well, um, perhaps to reduce costs, to increase safety, uh, you can modify, you can at least take into account the routes you are taking from point A to point B, and you can overlay them with the amount of exposure you're having for your aircraft and engine, and then you can modify a bit either your scheduling or your maintenance. Uh, uh, it can even go down to modifying your insurance agreements with maintenance companies, engine manufacturers. So it goes, as Sarah said, really technical and it's very sector specific. And so adaptation basically means opportunities. You try to avoid the risks by trying to be opportunistic and try to change what you're doing and what you plan to do according to the new information. That's what we're talking about. Thank you. I, I don't know if you wanted to add anything there, Marie, or is that is that fine? No, I think it's fine. I was also uh, just thinking about uh, in relationship to the to the question about water availability. So if there is, for example, more dust event and the snow is melting faster, it's also impacting uh, the production of hydropower. And as Sarah said, uh, when knowing in advance and taking that into account into hydrological model or snow model, then you can predict how much water uh, you put into dam or not for the production of electricity, for example. Thank you. Yeah, and Sarah says, great, thank you. Any more questions for our panelists? Okay, well, if there's no more, um, it just remains to say thank you to our panelists for taking time out today for, for presenting and taking your questions. Um, of course, if you've got any more questions, follow up queries, then you can reach out to each of our panelists at their email addresses. Um, I'm sure they'd be happy to talk to you uh, in more detail. Uh, so